right so hello everyone in this video we'll be going over uh, module 2 for empowerment technologies that is the internet so we'll be going over what the internet is how it has evolved some uh, common terms that are used in regards to, or with regards to the internet and we'll also be going over one interesting part of the internet namely the deep web okay so let us start first with the internet itself so what is the internet? The internet is a worldwide collection of networks that links millions of businesses, government agencies, educational institutions, and individuals. So it is more or less a, a very big network that connects a lot of people, a lot of organizations, a lot of um, institutions online. So there are two main ways that we can connect to the internet. The first one is wired. Here we connect a, a computer physically to the internet via a cable or a wire. So as you can see here on the right hand side we have uh, examples of cables. These are uh, I believe RJ45 cables and on the bottom right you can see how the internet will be uh, you or how the internet is set up with regards to a uh, wired connection so we usually have a cable from your computer to the modem that's your that's the Wi-Fi router or the modem router and then we have the modem connected to a jack on the wall so uh, some examples of a wired connection are cable internet service uh, DSL or digital subscriber line dial-up and LAN or local area network so these are some of the types of connections that we can use in order for us to uh, connect to the internet again these are wired typically these are uh, more limited in the range so the range that you can uh, the range of the a cable will determine how you can set up let's say your computer or your device but they are more stable and they are uh, usually uh, a bit faster than wireless speaking of wireless this is connecting uh, devices to the internet with a wireless modem so if you're using Wi-Fi if you're using mobile data all of these fall under a wireless connection even pocket Wi-Fi can fall under this or falls under this so we have uh, some examples here Wi-Fi what does Wi-Fi stand for Wi-Fi stands for wireless fidelity that is what that term means so Wi-Fi we also have mobile broadband in other words mobile data no we have things such as uh, smart and globe mobile data LTE 4G 5G fiber optics uh, we also have WAN or wireless air network and we have satellite uh, satellite internet service so that is if you are living in a very remote area or you are someone who's working in a very um, secluded area with a very limited connection so these are for connecting to your device wirelessly whether that's through Wi-Fi through mobile data or through satellite now here are some common terms that we always see when we are using the internet the first one is ISP or internet service provider so this is a business that provides individuals and organizations access to the internet for free or for a fee so uh, these are let's say your uh, companies which provide internet to you uh, on your phone or through a home connection so if they install let's say a device in your home those are all ISPs so the ones that I am sure most of you are familiar with are smart and globe smart um, and globe both offer uh, mobile data uh, they also offer 4g 5g and LTE connections for globe PLDT and sky these companies offer um, DSL and fiber connections so if you want to set up an internet connection at home a fixed connection through DSL or through fiber optics you can do that with these other companies um, that are available here we also have obviously converge we have uh, um, and if you're connecting let's say from uh, with the same from abroad uh, that is also considered an ISP so bandwidth bandwidth is the amount of data that travels over a network in other words this is your internet speed so how fast your internet is so we have kilobits per second or kbps and megabits per second mbps so when you're um, 
using a speed tester or when you are applying for a home connection, usually they'll measure the speed in Mbps, megabits per second, 10, 10 Mbps, 3 Mbps, 30 Mbps, 100 Mbps. That is your bandwidth. So that is how fast your internet is, how much data it can transfer over a period of time in this case how, ma how many megabits per second so obviously the faster the higher this number the better now we also have the IP address the IP address is a sequence of numbers that uniquely identifies each device connected to the in connected to the internet so we have the network ID here 192.168.1 and then we have the host ID.34 so simply put this is like the ID number of a device so your computer your laptop your phone your um, if you have a console a PlayStation or an Xbox or a switch if you have a TV a smart TV if you have a smart uh, let's say a smart IOT device such as Alexa all of those have a IP address associated with them. No, they are a way for us to identify what that device is when you are connecting to, connecting to the internet. We don't normally see it, but it is still there. On the other hand, we have the domain name and the domain name system. So the domain name is a text-based name that corresponds to the IP address, and the domain name system is uh, a system that translates the domain name into its associated IP address. So to differentiate this, the IP address is sort of your uh, code. It is a code or ID number no, that identifies a website, while the do dom domain name is more of the name itself. So um, think of it this way. Uh, let's take Google. Google is a website I'm sure you're all familiar with. Now, uh, you may think, oh, sir, what is the, does, does uh, Google have an IP address? Yes, Google has its own IP address. It's just that we don't really use that to access it. We make use of the domain name. No, Imagine having to say, oh, you should uh, try searching this on 192.168.1.34. No, that is very uh, lengthy to say. So, we make use of the IP address. Um, the domain name is meant to make it easier for us to access a website, to access a uh, uh, service online without having to remember, you know, 20 different numbers. So again, the name, the domain name is the name essentially, um, and then the IP address is the code or your ID number, your ID number, that is the number sign. Okay, so that is for IP address and domain name and domain name system. We also have now uh, World Wide Web. So World Wide Web is essentially a uh, space where information, documents, and other resources are located. So the best example of this is the Internet. So essentially, um, it, this, was, uh, this is a large network of data that is being sent and received um, uh, over uh, many groups of people, over many users, over many devices. So, let us look at how the internet has evolved over time. So, we'll start off with the first iteration of the web, Web 1.0. So, the Web 1.0. So, here we are searching for online viability. In other words, where are, where is the, um, or where is the um, use of this internet? So, uh, people were trying to figure out, okay, what can I do with this internet? How can I use this for my work, for my school, for entertainment, and so on? So what is really the purpose of this? So that is the focus of the first iteration. They didn't really know exactly what to show on the computer screen. So it's just a bit of like a free-for-all. No, people are just uploading random pictures, uh, uh, walls of text, random like website designs, it's a bit all over the place. So there's no cohesiveness, there's no like design principles, it's just you know put whatever you can into one website and call it a day. No? So that is the first iteration of the web or the internet rather. So as you can see here these are some common examples of how the internet was first used. On the left hand side as we can see education websites, this is a university. And as you can see here, there are academic years. So it's it's a uh, it's uh, an example of a university, and you can see here it's just literally a wall of text with some links on the right hand side. So there's really no 
no design principles. And uh, if you notice, this was this is still being used in 2011. So this website hasn't changed for a long, long while. On the right hand side, we have dinosaur profiles. So this is again an educational website. This is meant for obviously learning and teaching. And as you can see different designs for the buttons of the dinosaurs and uh, some if you click that you will be brought to some information including pictures and whatnot so this is another example of an educational site what is co what was commonly found on web 1.0 a call to action so call to action is a hyperlink or a button so this is usually a verb so here you are uh, this is where we see now that um, the rise of let's say not necessarily clickbait, but more of a very, very um, uh, eye-catching ads. So a lot of uh, websites started employing this, whether that's for you know advertisements, whether that's for you to subscribe to the service, whether that's for you to sign up. That doesn't matter. These were all very, uh, very eye-catching um, buttons or eye-catching text that will. Uh, try to entice you to click on them or to uh, um, um, select them. So that is something that was still common even during Web 1.0. We also have buttons, one of the first graphic layouts. So as you can see, this was meant for links, handling links. So we have different button styles. Um, again, this is a very old design. Uh, eventually, buttons started evolving. Some of them... Um, stayed like this but others uh, became let's say more more streamlined or they, they have more cleaner designs or more fancy designs we also have shops online shops um, this was although uh, this may seem kind of uh, it may not seem believable what you see on the right hand side here is actually amazon.com when it was first initially released so amazon.com books uh, when Amazon was first released as a website, it was mainly used for books. But eventually, as more and more people used the site, the, the, uh, they decided to expand to include other products such as you know clothes, gadgets, electronics, um, um, even like uh, groceries even, um, and other um, products that you can find online now. So this is a very good example of how the web has evolved over time so as you can see very the, the logo is like uh, very i guess hard to read you can see that the the, the text earth earth's biggest bookstore is is somewhat smudged in the background and then we have here just a bunch of links to different option or different uh, uh, uh articles or options and and um there that's it there's no product picture so far you'll have to click links or you'll have to browse a bit further to actually see all of the options it's a stark difference from what is uh, amazon like now so that is how how the web 1.0 initially is here's another good example this website over here uh, arngren.net um, you can try to check this if it's still alive when we checked this before it was still working and it still had this uh, very uh, let's just say unique website design as you can see very um, there is a lot of uh, uh, products just placed everywhere it's it's meant to be a website that sells as you can see toys toys and gadgets but um, it has a very very crowded interface no so this is an example of how the web was uh, or how web 1.0 was utilized it was just like put everything into a, into one page and call it a day no it's up to the user to figure it out uh, here are some characteristics of the web of web 1.0 so first it's readable of the web with flat data so keep that in mind flat data readable web so the web uh, here is very um, flat in other words it is just text it is just readable content you make a website you upload uh, content to the website and then again you call it a day you don't really try to add new things you don't really try to communicate with your users your, your users cannot really respond or reply whatever's on the website is uh, all that 
there will be no there's no like new content or uh, users will not be able to upload their own content it has limited interaction between users and sites so there's no feedback system yet there is no um a commenting system it is all just um you you upload a website and that's it it is also uh, an information portal so simply put users passively receive information as you saw earlier it uh, for the most part it is just uh, educational or business sites there is no form of feedback again no likes no dislikes no comments no um, no sort of feedback available uh, on whether or not you like the content you like the site etc Examples obviously are educational websites, company websites, and government websites. We also have now, uh, moving after that, is Web 2.0. So Web 2.0 is was uh, done or created after the technicalities of the web was established. So here, we focused more on the social change and not much on the technical change. So here, we are focusing more now on how the web is changing things socially. So how is the web changing things on in terms of society so uh, what we have now are networks in other words social networks no we have uh, facebook obviously myspace uh, we have twitter we have pinterest we have youtube uh, tools such as google plus skype um, and let's say uh, yahoo messenger even if if uh, any of you reach that stage those are all tools are uh, those are all tools that are used now for communication. They are used now to socialize. So there's a lot of networks now online which allow you to share and um, um, communicate with others online. We also have links. So sharing links now is very common. No, uh, have you have you been to this link? Have you checked out this website? No. Oh, I watched this funny video on YouTube. Let me send you the link. Oh, I watched this cool video on. Oh, I found this cool website. Um, uh, here's the link so that is now what is happening more and more people are sharing links more and more people are sharing content via these links so you'll see now a lot of websites are trying to make links which are catchy which are easy to remember because it is uh, beneficial to them it will allow them it will allow their users to easily remember and easily share it no compared to if your website was very long the name was very long or very complicated or it was a mouthful to say we also had collaboration so collaboration in the form of different online tools which will help you let's say you know work with your team uh, work with your uh, group on a project so you can see on the right hand side different tools that you can find online for you to be able to um, collaborate so again we're not limited anymore by distance we can work with others online um, easily without having to resort to meeting up face to face or meeting up in person just to work on a project we also have a very big content uh, and reach on web 2.0 so as you can see here we're able to access uh, the internet on our phones on our tablets uh, another example of a tablet and a laptop or computers so we are not limited anymore by just one device again uh, b before we had cell phones uh, which only could call and text and we still have those now but that was more common back then but now most people have access to a smartphone which allows you to uh, connect with people online let's take a look at this one here so uh, this is to give you a perspective on how much content is being shared online so this is what happens in a so-called internet minute this was for 2019 but I think it's still relevant now so uh, let's every 60 seconds uh, according to this uh, there are 1 million people logging into facebook so 1 million people are currently logging into facebook or at least close to that are logging in right now we also have 18 million text sent um, that's text messages sms 4.5 million videos viewed so not not views no it's videos there are 4.5 million videos currently being watched right now so again it just shows the scale of how much content is currently online especially on sites like youtube which allow you to upload videos for free we have around 400,000 apps being downloaded so that's games movie movie apps entertainment apps educational apps and so on 
around 350,000 are scrolling Instagram. So um, those uh, those people who use Instagram, uh, again, a lot of a lot of them are currently scrolling it right now. Around 90,000 or so people tweeting. So on Twitter, again, a lot of people are. Uh, it's very easy to make a tweet. It just takes you less than a minute to type out something and then post it. So uh, it's obvious that it will make a lot of people inclined to to share their thoughts share their ideas 1.4 million swipes on tinder that's a dating application we also have 188 million email sent so emails this may seem like oh no one uses that we we just use messenger but no emails is still very very common and used often so as you can see almost 200 million emails sent every minute so imagine the volume of emails that you are sending and receiving uh that that people are sending and receiving at this very moment uh, twitch which is a streaming site for games 1 million views so every 60 seconds there's a million people currently watching different streamers 41 streaming subscriptions so for uh, there are uh, people subscribing to new or this new streaming site such as um, um, spotify or iTunes etc we have smart speaker shipped Amazon Echo so here again um, this is uh, an IOT device so how many being bought and shipped every second 1 million or 4.8 million gifs or gifs so this is again another example of media sharing how many pictures or how many gifs are being shared every minute messenger and whatsapp how many messages 41.6 million messages being sent so right now uh, there is approximately 40 million messages being sent being received uh, through messenger through whatsapp through uh, all of these messaging apps combined so imagine the volume of messages per hour or per day just how many messages are being sent 2.1 million snaps created on snapchat 1 million dollars close to 1 million being spent online so every minute a million dollars is being spent online so imagine every every 24 hours potentially ma the maximum amount will be let's say 24 million roughly um being spent every day 24 million dollars being spent every day online that's why a lot of people are moving their stores moving their shops online because as you can see it's a very very lucrative business uh, around 700,000 hours of movies or content watch on netflix so imagine that a lot of videos a lot of uh, shows being watched and then on google 3.8 million search queries so imagine the amount of people searching content searching uh, websites searching whatever on google okay so again just to give you an amount of the scale it's reached it reached a point where uh on web 1.0 we simply had you know a handful of people to web 2.0 everyone and anyone is making content it doesn't matter if you are doing it for fun you're doing it for work you're doing it as a hobby you're doing it um uh, out of passion it doesn't matter you are all uh everyone is able to upload content share their ideas share their thoughts online so that is leading to a lot of content being shared being um, um posted on the internet so another uh, aspect of web 2.0 is friends friends and socialization social media obviously promotes socialization you are more prone to share your ideas meet up new people meet up with try to uh, meet up and find new friends so some of you might be um, or might have your online friends that you have never met in person and that is again something that is uh, brought about thanks to the thanks to web 2.0 so we have online friends we have online communications online communities which are forming to promote because um, many people are you know seeking uh, trying to seek uh, friendship or trying to find people with common interests common ideas on the internet we also have the power of networks you know we have people who like to share people who like to um, post content and there's a lot of people who try uh, their best or trying their dar uh, try their utmost to um, go viral so that is something that is uh, common online going viral so people are trying 
to become popular through social media posts, through viral posts, and so on. So there's many user-generated content that we can find online, text posts, videos, uh, photos, interactions, it, such as comments, tags, and ratings. So these are now um, the power of networks. As you can see, um, the more likes you have, usually that will mean that your your post has more reach, has more influence, has more um, has more feedback, no, has more interactions. Now, what are some characteristics of Web 2.0? It is the writable face. It is the writable face of the World Wide Web. In other words, people are not on not no longer just reading they are writing they are posting content posting videos posting pictures posting images and so on so it facilitates the interaction between users and sites and allows users to interact freely with each other it encourages participation collaboration and information sharing and examples of this are wiki uh, wikipedia rather or these are all wikis wikipedia wikihow we also have youtube Flickr, and facebook so all of these are tools which, al which will allow us to share and um, uh, upload content online, whether that's text, video, or picture content. Okay, now that is Web 2.0. That's the social web, the writable web. What about Web 3.0? Web 3.0 is, uh, is now known as the semantic web. Here, the focus is about the meaning of data. We want to know what all of this data is. We have so much data, so many pictures, so many videos. We want to understand what those videos, what those content are about. No. So now, Web 3.0 is driven by technological changes. So here's an example. What, what, exactly, is the, what exactly is happening in Web 3.0? Um, suppose you are a stamp collector. And over time, you have many stamps, so you have a collection. And for each stamp, you create a document. So that is uh, a document that shows maybe the name of the stamp, where it's from, the let's say the cost or the amount, um, a description, and so on. And uh, over time, let's say you have 100 stamps, that means you have 100 documents. If you have 1,000 stamps, that means you have 1,000 documents, if you make one document per stamp. So obviously, that's a lot to sort through. Now, um, since you have so many stamps, how now do you find a specific stamp? The key is here, search engines, um, indexing. No? Tools like Google, Yahoo, Bing, these are the, these are sites which seem very simple. Google is, uh, if you go to google.com, the website, the, the page looks very simple, but there's a lot of very complex technologies, complex algorithms behind that website, behind that tool. So what these websites do is that they, they take a collection of documents and they index them. They organize them by keywords. No? Google, Yahoo, Bing, Google especially, uh, um, searches content through keywords. So that's why when you search content on Google, you don't type, okay, I want to search, let's say, oh, I want to search um, best types of, let's say, uh, best cell phone for selfies. Uh, when you're when you're searching that you want to search the best type of cell phone for selfies when you search that you don't say oh google i want to know what type of cell phone is best for selfies you don't type that question you don't type the whole question you simply type keywords uh best phone selfies there or best phone for selfies you type only specific keywords because that is what google will use in order for it to find content online to, to sort through all of the websites all of the results as you can see here just stamp collecting just the the, the keywords stamp and collecting you have 1.6 uh, 1.6 million results already so imagine uh, having to sort through all of those in 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 less than a second no so that's why we make use of keywords so for example you're searching red stamps again you type the keywords you don't say oh i uh, google i want to know what's uh, i want to know more about red stamps no you simply type red stamps and as you can see here 67 million results so how does a computer know what i mean when we structurally describe that a stamp is a stamp and red is a color so uh Describing data in a structured way can best be done in the database. Again, um, 
this is what what web 3.0 is about you are structuring your data what do you mean by this let's take uh youtube and facebook as as our examples on facebook when you upload a picture to your page or to your profile usually it will ask you to give a description right it will ask you to tag people when you are tagging your friends when you are tagging certain people in the picture uh, sometimes facebook will suggest based on the face so you'll notice that it will try to detect the faces in the picture and suggest who that person might be so it might be someone in your friends list it might be someone you know and that that simple thing is an example of a um, feature of web 3.0 you are taking you are trying to describe as much of the content online as possible to make sure that it's easy to organize that that it is easy to to sort no that's why on youtube when you upload videos to youtube if you guys are uploading content there you have your own channels usually it'll ask you to tag right it'll ask you to put tags to put a description why is that only for the is that only for the viewers yes that's for the viewers the, the description the caption but that's also for google for yahoo to be able to properly index those so that if i search let's say funny cat video uh google will know that your video is a type of funny cat video and it will suggest it to your to the people searching no that's the idea of web 3.0 we are not we are now trying to take all of this content all of these millions and millions of pictures if you recall how many posts how many videos uploaded per minute we're trying to take all of those and then trying to make sure that we are properly labeling them with the correct description correct tags correct information so that when we search for them when we try to find them again we can easily find them or we can easily uh, locate those content again so web 3.0 to put it simply is a big collection of databases where we're connecting on demand and the web 3.0 depends on the structure and description of data so again how we how we structure how we label our data how we label our content is the most important so uh, where the data located is irrelevant is located is irrelevant it doesn't matter if it's on facebook if it's on youtube if it's on vimeo if it's on um uh myspace it what matters is whether or not it is properly labeled properly um uh, properly uh, tagged no that's why if you notice there's a lot of um um or when when you search for content you'll get a lot of results which are mixed no you'll get results from facebook or get results from youtube get results from let's say vimeo get results from daily motion etc no it's not just one website or one source so um here uh, web 3.0 is known as the executable phase executable why because we are now trying to um execute searches we are trying to conduct searches on data we're trying to search content search media online so dynamic applications interactive interactive services and machine to machine interaction um what do you mean by this uh, an example of this is um facebook logins no you may notice guys uh, if we go back here um connected on demand so we are linking data here here's the keyword linking data so example is facebook when you visit certain websites some websites um allow you to actually log in using your facebook account no you don't have to you don't have to um you don't have to uh, create a new account you don't have to log in using 20 different accounts you can just have facebook and then log into several different apps several different websites several different games and whatnot using just your facebook account no you are linking data so facebook now is sharing its data so that it you'll be able to, to log into this other website this other service without having to go through the hassle of signing up that is one of the features of web 3.0 that that feature we really wasn't that common back then no yes we had facebook before we had facebook in 2012 2013 but if you wanted to go to another website you had to make a new account so we would have to juggle like 10 different accounts for 10 different websites but now you can have one account let's say facebook or or google one account and then share it across seven different 10 different services 10 different websites okay so uh computers no so the semantic web is uh refers now to the future so we're trying to um uh 
prepare data, trying to analyze data, make sure it's ready for future technologies, and computers now can interpret information like humans. Again, many search engines now are getting better and better every day. They're getting more accurate, they're able now. So I mentioned earlier, oh, don't search like, oh, hello, Google, How's, how was your day? Um, uh, do you know what this is about? So before, that was not really possible. But now, to some extent, again, it's limited. But some search engines are able to somewhat understand that. So even if you type your question out like that, you, uh, Google can still sort of interpret and try to find keywords. But again, it's not recommended because it's not going to be very accurate compared to if you just type the keywords directly. So uh, Web 3.0 intelligently generates and distributes useful content tailored to the needs of users. Again, you're trying to um, uh, make sure that you are sending, you are showing the correct content to the correct users. If I search for red stamps, obviously I will not get blue stamps as my result. If I'm taking, if I'm checking, let's say. Um, I want to search. Oh, I want to search a four-wheel drive car. Uh, the the uh, Google will shouldn't give me, let's say, pictures or search results for, let's say, a sedan or a bike. No, that's the idea there. So here is a bit of a um, a bit of a table showcasing a summary of the different types of web. So we have the first one, Web 1.0. This was in 1994 to 2000. It is the static web. Uh, with web, limited number of authors, and it has static information. Again, data is static, it's not changing. You simply post it once, upload it once, and you're good to go. Oh, sorry. Uh, we also have Web 2.0, 2000 to 2010. So this is known as the social web. So here, people now are uh, uploading their own content, uploading their own uh, videos, uploading their own uh, pictures online. So there's now a lot of interactivity, a lot of people posting and sharing different works. Uh, web 3.0 is now the semantic web, 2010 to 2020. So this is now focusing on individual users. You are now trying to um, uh, trying to uh, make sure that you are um, properly labeling data, properly searching or um, categorizing data and then when someone searches for that data you can provide it exactly what they want or exactly what they're searching for so that is one of the strengths one of the features of web 3.0 the semantic web and then web 4.0 is now 23 uh, 2020 to 2030 that is the intelligent web so this is more of a hypothetical phase here we are focusing now on self-learning so self-learning is essential or self-learning essentially means that it is um the data is um uh, able to adapt to the user so for example let's say you are someone let's say on youtube a simple example is this on youtube you're let's say you search a lot of um a lot of um uh, let's say vlogs you are someone who likes to watch vlogs travel vlogs you know um, sky, uh, sports vlogs or generally vlogs in general so what will happen as you browse more and more vlog content YouTube will say oh this user must be interested or must like vlogs so let's let's end up recommending let's end up um, recommending some vlog channels or vlog videos to them so that uh, they can watch those so that is what happens now no self-learning the web is trying to adapt to each and every user so that's why if you notice your newsfeed on Facebook is not the same as my newsfeed and your friends newsfeed no we may have some similarities some similar content being posted but for the most part it is very different because it adapts to each user what each user likes dislikes what they like to view what they like to watch what they like to comment on and so on now, uh, we have something here called the World Wide Web. Um, other common terms. Here we'll go over some of the other terms that are used on the internet. So we have something called a URL. A URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. So this is essentially a web resource that specifies its location on a computer network with on a, and on a mechanism for retrieving it. Um, so for example here, this is a URL, this entire thing. Uh, but this URL has different parts. First is HTTP, this one here. So HTTP, 
We'll discuss what this is in a moment. We have www, which stands for obviously the World Wide Web. We have example. Example here is the host name. In other words, the name of the website. So Google, Yahoo, Bing, YouTube, etc. That is the host name. .com is the TLD, top level domain. Again, we'll discuss that in a moment. And then we have the file name and then .html. So what are, uh, let's focus on the first four since this is what you'll most likely see, what you'll most likely interact with online. So the first one, HTTP. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. This is the method now used to transfer information on the web. So when you are sending, uh, when you are sending videos online, when you are uploading videos, when you are browsing a site, you are making use of uh, HTTP. HTTP. So this is what you'll see at the beginning of every link. This stands again for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Now there's a second version here called HTTPS. Or which uh, which stands for hypertext transfer protocol over secure socket layer or it's hypertext transfer protocol secure so the s is essentially secure or over secure socket layer so essentially this is a more secure form oh sorry that's a bit messy let's remove that this is a more secure form of HTTP which uses uh, which is used when authenticating data in other words when you log in to your accounts YouTube, Facebook, Gmail, Yahoo Mail, um, when you log into Zoom, when you log into Skype, when you are logging into uh, Canvas, uh, when you are uh, logging into your bank account on, let's say, BDO, BPI, um, PNB, when you are um, logging into uh, shopping apps, Shopee, Lazada, all of these make use of HTTPS. So HTTPS essentially means that the website collection is secure. In other words, no one can see what you're sending, what you're receiving. So if you enter your password, no one outside the website, no one except the website itself can see your password no so if i if i'm a hacker and i try to snoop i try to try to see what you're sending what you're trying to log in with on google on yahoo i cannot see exactly what information is being sent between you and between yahoo or between youtube or between facebook that's what https means um, that for www this is essentially detecting or checking if a website is on the world wide web again this is something that's not necessarily needed uh, you can remove this both of these since it's um, the website itself which will sort of determine you don't have to put http or https or www every time you visit a site you can just type google.com and let the website handle the rest but this is something to, to keep in mind especially for https uh, if you're if you're buying something online, if you're entering, let's say, personal info, if you're entering, let's say, credit card or debit card information because you want to buy something online or send money online, make sure that the website is has HTTPS at the beginning, or else there's a there's a big chance that your information will be leaked or hacked. Host name, host name is essentially the uh, website name. So uh, here. Hostname is the website name, the domain name, no? So Google, Yahoo, YouTube, etc. So we also have what we call TLD or top level domains. This is the last segment of a website followed by a dot. So we can have generic ones, .com, .net, or countries. We can have um, PH uh, for Philippines, SG for Singapore, US for United States. So uh, here are some commonly used top level domains. We have .com, which is for commercial websites. So sites like Google, YouTube, uh, we have Amazon, we have Lazada, we have Shopee. All of these websites are commercial. They are businesses. So they are um, companies which will make use of .com. We also have .edu, which are educational websites. Examples are uh, let's say uc-bcf.edu we have .gov which are for government agencies .mil for military organizations .net .net is either for commercial organizations businesses or network providers so some ISPs like Smart and Globe uh, you might see them use this but it uh, other times they'll use .com so it depends no but there are some websites which use .net these are usually uh, 
um, network providers or they are still commercial companies. And then we have .org, which is for nonprofit. So nonprofit organizations. Examples are Wikipedia, wikipedia.org. If you want to uh, visit Wikipedia site, you put .org at the end and you'll notice that they don't accept any uh, or they have no sponsorships. They are uh, no, they have no ads. Um, they get their funding mainly through donations. So you'll see that on Wikipedia. That is one example of a non-profit organization. We also have search engines. These are tools which are used to search data online. So we kept mentioning Google earlier, but there are others that uh, we can find online. We have Google, we have Yahoo, we have Yandex, we have AOL, we have Ask, Baidu rather, and Bing. So these are different search engines that we can use, we can find on the internet. We also have subject directories. So these are essentially how, um, how a, a search engine organizes the content on its, on its site. So this is one way to organize it. So for example here, travel, we have different options for travel. We have attractions, consolidators, destination, lodging, preparation, travel agents, etc. So as you can see here, this is how uh, one way that uh, websites or let's say search engines will organize their content. They organize them into subject categories or directories rather. So they'll, okay, which, okay, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Lazada, what type of website is this? Okay, we'll put it here. Um, Shopee, what type of website is this? Oh, we'll put it here. What about AirAsia? Okay, what type of website is AirAsia? Oh, it can be, let's say, a uh, um, uh, travel agent or a specialty travel. So we'll put that there and so on. No, So you are organizing, you are organizing the different um, websites, different content into different uh, categories. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the internet. So again, just to briefly summarize, we have uh, four, st four current sort of stages of the internet. We'll focus on the first three. Web 1.0 is the static web. There is no uh, content. It's simply static, flat, flat content. There is nothing that is really being changed. You upload once and leave it as is. There's no interaction, no feedback, no nothing. It is just I upload content and then I post content and then I let people view or watch whatever I post. That is for Web 1.0. Web 2.0 is the social web now. It is where people now are able to upload uh, through social media, anything they want, pictures, videos, text, and so on. So this is now where many people are sharing their own ideas, their own content, their own uh, perspectives and whatnot. So it is now a, a social uh, um, phase where people now are trying to communicate, trying to find like-minded people, like like-minded communities and so on. Web 3.0 is now the semantic web. It is where we are trying now to categorize and organize all the data. So imagine we have like 100,000 videos uploaded a second in YouTube or something, or how many posts uploaded to, to Facebook, to Twitter every second. So in order to make sure that we can manage all of those, we need to label them properly, we need to tag them properly, we need to make sure that our systems, our search engines, our different applications can be able to detect, be able to search content online. So it's not just, oh, uh, we'll just keep uploading and uploading and just, you know, eventually um, we'll have so much content that we, we, we can't find any more we, we we really cannot you know search anything anymore no we want to make sure that we organize everything that we're uploading online so that if you want to search for something we want to find something it is easy and then the last one web 4.0 which is again sort of a hypothetical phase uh intelligent web here we're now trying to cater to all of the users so we're trying to see okay this user likes to browse this type of content let's give them this suggestion oh this user likes to browse let's say um uh, cars or we'll give them some videos of cars uh, different types of racing events and whatnot or this person likes to likes to browse on cooking uh, cooking shows so we'll, we'll suggest some cooking shows some cooking channels and so on that's the idea there we are trying now to personalize uh, content for every user okay going now to an uh, uh, section of the internet 
we have this topic called the deep web. So before I proceed, there's a lot of misconceptions with the deep web. Here we'll try to um, we'll try to um, um, what they call this. We'll try to clear up those misconceptions and try to clarify what really is the deep web. Because there's many terms that we hear: deep web, dark web, and so on. What are these? So we'll try to clarify those and what do they mean. Okay, so deep web. Let's start off with that. Let me ask you all a question. 96% uh, of the internet is not indexed by search engines such as Google and Bing. So how? How is that possible? 96%, that's the majority of the internet. How is it that most of it is not really findable? I mean, you saw earlier, right? If we search, let's say, red stamps, we get 67 million results. Imagine 67 million websites or web pages, and that's only like 4% of the internet. Is that really the case? And you'll find out who, uh, exactly why that's the case. So let's try to let's try to see. Uh, I'll give you five seconds to guess why, or to to think of a reason why in your head, and then once we get to the lesson, I want you to check if your guess is correct. So one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So now, uh, if you have an idea on your head, keep that in mind. And I want to see. Uh, let's see if your if your idea on why this is the case, uh, why uh, why there's so much content that's hidden. I want you to see if your idea is uh, correct or not, or if it's if it matches what we have here in our discussion. So, let us look at this infograph here. We'll see here that um, the internet is composed of three main parts. We have the surface web, as you can see here. We have Wikipedia, BBC, Facebook here. We have the deep web, which has LinkedIn, Netflix, ha, huh, Netflix, PayPal, Dropbox, Facebook, really? Facebook, deep web, WhatsApp, Bank of America, and so on. And then the dark web. Here, a small part. We have Silk Road, Alphabay, DuckDuckGo, and so on. So, um, what exactly is the difference between these three and why is it that some of them can be found in multiple sites? So, Facebook can be found twice. LinkedIn uh, can be considered part of the surface web. Uh, DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo can be both on the deep web and it can also be on the surface web. So, why is it in three categories at once? Let's try to understand why. So, surface web. Uh, let's start with that. Uh, it is uh, the surface web because it is all the above water content that average internet users per use on a daily basis. Example is YouTube, Facebook, Google, uc-bcf.edu.ph. All of these sites are considered part of the surface web. No, all of these sites are considered surface level. They are what you use every day. No, so that is the surface web. Pretty straightforward. What about the deep web now? Uh, now, the deep web is all of the internet that cannot be found by regular search engines, such as the pages, or as the pages are not indexed in any way. So it's compromised or comprised rather of the uh, same general host names as sites on the surface web, but with a few differences. What do you mean by this? Let's clarify that in a moment. So this is the specific URL of your Facebook Messenger thread with a friend or the dashboard of your Edmodo account or the inbox of your Gmail account. So the deep web is the majority of the internet as a whole. Okay? So in other words, to clarify, here, let's take Facebook. Uh, wait. Let us remove that. That's a bit ugly. Let's use, let's use blue to match Facebook. So Facebook. Let's just write this. Um, let's newsfeed. Facebook home. Okay, so let us try to um, take a look at this a bit closer. So Facebook, when you log in, when you open Facebook.com, assuming you're not logged in, you will end up at Facebook home, no? Now, you will uh, end up essentially at the home page, right? The home page will say, oh, connect with people. Uh, please enter your login here and then um, click login. Or if you are new, create a new account. So Facebook home. Facebook home is part now of the surface web. 
so let's oh my gosh that looks terrible let's try to erase that uh, here surface there so Facebook home is actually part of the surface web it is part of the above water web no it is part of the um, the surface web everything that you view every day okay fair enough right i think that makes sense now uh let's say you go to facebook now you log in so you log in you enter your username you enter your password you go okay login accepted Ching, it's all right now you'll enter now the news feed your news feed right you all of you have a news feed all of you have like a daily feed where you see where you see the content of your friends people uh, that post that share their ideas people sharing posts people sharing videos pictures you you are all familiar with that or at least most of you are familiar with that that part now of facebook is now considered part of the deep web there that's pretty much it so um facebook home is the surface web as soon as you log in that is not a deep web that's it really sir that's it yes the deep web is not is not there's a common misconception where the deep web is this dark scary place where there's ghosts and monsters and aliens no the deep web is simply a part of the web that is hidden behind search engines no can can google access your newsfeed no can can bing can yahoo access your your messenger contacts or your messenger messages no so that content that is hidden from face from from youtube not from youtube from google from yahoo is now considered part of the deep web so all of those your private messages your emails this uh, zoom meeting a zoom meeting is considered part of the deep web no because all of those are hidden all of those are not really shown in the public they're not really visible to the public so all of that is the deep web okay i hope that's clear with everyone so that is why the deep web is the majority no where is all of the content on facebook is it on the webs is it on the home page no a majority of the content on facebook is on the login screen when you log in the marketplace the groups your messenger chats all of those are hidden behind a login screen so those are now part of the deep web okay so why are so many pages hidden? Uh, Google's indexing system begins with a process called crawling. So imagine a vo virtual robot spider. It crawls through different web pages. It goes, okay, let's try the home page. Can we access it? All right, great. So the uh, home page is accessible. Let's try now the login screen. Can we access it? Yes, we can. We can click buttons in the login page. Okay, great. But what about let's say? Um, let's say the facebook marketplace can we try to access that oh the web the, the spider will crawl to the marketplace oh it's blocked we can't access it so what will happen now is that whatever's behind the marketplace is now hidden is now no longer visible by google okay that is how the uh indexing works or how crawling works with regards to google and other similar search engines so what can you find on the deep web? Well, on the deep web, you can find a lot of content. Examples are records, certificates, name directories, library indexes. We have password protected and members only websites, timed access pages, digital media content that's blocked under a paywall, the back end dashboard of any sort of individual account, uh, whether it's banking, social platforms or email services two-party user-to-user communications or threads on social media chat services messaging platforms etc so the dark web is uh, so that's the deep web that's that's the content now on the deep web okay so again it's not as creepy it's not as scary it's very mundane very very simple content it's just you know um emails messages banking details yes some of them are sensitive data but it's not as spoopy or as scary as it assu as you assume now let's go to the dark web oh this is something that you probably have heard of on clickbait youtube videos uh let's just clarify Cla contrary to popular belief the deep web and the dark web are actually two separate definitions so the dark web is different from the deep web no do not use them interchangeably a lot of online creators a lot of media a lot of news sites make use of them interchangeably oh the dark web the deep web no these are two separate things so what are they so the dark web 
there's a, a lot of common dis misconceptions as you can see on the left hand side it's just oh spooky scary it's like ghosts and murderers and hitmen and, and aliens again this is a clickbait um, uh, type of uh, content this isn't really the case no on the right hand side is what the dark web is really like connection issues no the dark web is very very slow to access even with a fast connection so you need to really wait a long time for websites to load no you spend sometimes more time on the loading screen than you do on the website itself that's how slow it is no but there's a reason for that there's a reason why the dark web is so slow so the dark web is a subset of the deep web that's only accessible through software that guards anonymity. So because of this, the, the dark web is home to entities that don't want to be found. Um, the dark web contains URLs that end in .onion rather than .gov, .com, or .edu. So here, the dark web is only available on special software. And it because of this, it is, it is home definitely to criminals, but it is not um, what it may seem initially. And instead of accessing them at .com, .edu, they are accessed through URLs that end in .onion. So what can you actually find on the dark web? We have drugs, so stolen info, weapons, uh, malware, hacking services, hitmen for hire, child pornography, torrented content, leaked data dumps, and whistleblowers. Uh, data, leaked data dumps are like leaked passwords, leaked uh, profiles, leaked information. So for example, let's say... Let's say there is a security breach at Facebook, uh, and then let's say 200 accounts were leaked. That leaked information will sometimes end up on the dark web. So that is what we mean by leaked data dumps. Whistleblowers, on the other hand, are people who are, um, they are trying to expose a company or an, an organization by revealing sensitive or confidential information. For example, let's say, let's say, um, as an example, let's say, uh, uh, the CIA, or oh, th there's a common topic that you find online. The CIA is secretly spying on, on certain people. And then, let's say you work for the CIA, you say, Oh, this is not right. This is unethical. I, I don't want this to happen. I want this to be exposed. I want people to know the truth. So, what you will do is you will go uh, online. You will, you will no, let's say from your work, you will take confidential documents. You'll copy them, and then you'll go online and then upload them so that... Uh, people will be able to view it publicly. That is whistleblowing. You are you are uh, posting, uh, you are publicly posting confidential or private information in order for you to sort of um, expose a a a problem, a crime, or something that is unethical or that is that is let's say a scam. So, for example, oh, you you know that let's say this company, this person is scamming someone, but they're pretending to be let's say a good person online. You can then expose them. You can become a whistleblower and expose them online for let's say doing things that are unethical. That is what whistleblowing is. So, how do we access the dark web? We make use of something called Thor, or Thor rather, T O R. So Tor, the dark web is a web, uh, uh, not a website, but it is a part of the dark uh, deep web that can only be accessed by a special browser called Tor, which stands for the Onion Router. Again, onions. Why onion? We'll discuss it in a moment. So Tor, T-O-R. That's the logo over there. So Tor, the Tor browser is uh, a browser that can be used to access both or uh, the surface web and the deep web including the dark web so it can access all three you can access facebook you can log into facebook but you can also access the dark web which is a different part of the internet so it's easy to use this interface is similar to mozilla firefox okay so that's how it looks like over there on the right hand side as you can see very very um very similar to Firefox, no? no? Doesn't look anything strange, nothing out of place. It just has a purple theme, that's all. So, just a bit of history. The Tor browser was created by someone. That someone is the United States Naval Research Laboratory. Again, it was made by the United States Naval Research Laboratory and is partially funded by the U.S. Department of Defense. So, as you can see, uh, it was the... the, the, the the dark web was created in thanks to the United States. They, they created it for a specific purpose. So I'll explain what that is in a moment. 
So how Tor works? So Tor is meant to be, uh, it's meant to sort of reroute your connection to different nodes or to different servers. So I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the dark web is very slow. There's a reason for that. So normally, right, let's, let's take a pen tool. Let's just read again. So normally, let's say we have two people. We have Alice and we have Dave. So Alice wants to send a message to Dave. Normally, we will just send it directly. Okay, send a message. Let's say we'll send an email. There. They will just send the message directly from Alice to Dave. So, straightforward. The, the message will be delivered directly. So, it's quite fast, quite, quite quick. So, no problems there. But, what about now if you use Tor? How does Tor send a message? So, when you send a message to Tor, what will happen now is that you will make use of a network, a different node. So, let's say you want to send a message, same as before, but this time, you'll send it to Bob. Here. So how does this work? First, Alice will send the message to this node here. Then this node will send it, uh, or server you could say, it is called server. This server will then send it to this server. And then this server will send it to this server. After which, the message will be received by Bob. So uh, it's at this point now that Bob will now receive the message. So again, normally it would just be direct, one way. Alice to Dave, direct. Uh, you send, she sends the message, she receives the message. But here, what will happen is that Alice will send it through three different nodes or three, three different servers before it's received by Bob. So what happens, guys, is that um, if, Bob, if Bob tries to check who sent the message, they will think it's from this PC. They will not be able to tell that it's Alice who sent the message. So that's basically how Tor works. You are hiding behind several layers of servers, no? That's part of why it's so slow, because your connection is going to jump between different servers before getting to the recipient. Compared to here, where it's direct, your connection is straightforward. On the, on the other hand, here, your connection is jumping from server to server to server to server. Okay, so that is why it is quite slow, it is quite uh, laggy when you are trying to access websites, access content online on, on the dark web. Same thing here. If let's say, okay, I want to connect now to Jane. Will I use the same nodes? No. Here, the computer will now select a different set of nodes. So in this case, the middle one first, then this one here, oh, no, sorry, then this one here, and then this one here, and then Jane. So as you can see, it is jumping, it, it changes from uh, connection to connection. So if it's to Bob, it's one way. If it's to Jane, another way. So when Jane tries to check where does the connection come from, she will think it comes from this PC over here. Okay, so that's pretty much how how Tor works. It is a uh, it jumps from connection to connection, um, or node to node in order for you to connect to a certain website or certain system. So again, this provides a layer of anonymity, a layer of like protection to prevent yourself from being discovered by whoever's receiving your data or whoever's receiving your message. Okay, so uh, simply put, the Tor uh, makes use of uh, Onion. It is an Onion network again because messages are encapsulated in layers of encryption similar to an Onion. Here, take a look. This is one layer. So each layer is like, think of it like uh, each layer needs to be opened with a key. Let's put it that way. Each layer is uh, is locked with a key and it needs to be opened one by one. So you 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 here there is four layers of keys. So we send this to the first uh, node. They open it with one key. So you see there one layer is gone, and then the next node will open it with another key. The the third layer or the second layer is gone. This node will now open it with the third key, so the, the third layer is gone. And then lastly, this node will open it with the last key, so now they have access to the data. So again, you lock it behind several layers of keys, you could say keys, and then it will be opened one by one, or onions. This it's uh, will peel back one layer of the onion here, then another layer, then another layer, then another layer. So we are um, trying to cover as much information as possible before we reach the destination.
okay so dangers of the dark web browsing so we have hackers getting caught for something illegal spying by isps and the government and penalties and legal issues so um you may be wondering you might be wondering sir why why the heck did the government create or why did the u.s government create tor so if you recall it is made by the united states naval research laboratory why would they create tor because they are uh, the government the u.s government Let's use this here. Or no, let's let's actually use the next slide since it's a bit blank. So what why would the government use or why would the US government create Tor? So let's say this is the US government. So assuming they are uh, uh, they want to use Tor, uh, the reason why they use they created Tor was for them to have encrypted or to have um secure connections secure communication so for example if they want to send a secure message a secure let's say um, a secure let's say email a secure uh, call they can do that using thor uh, thor rather so that is great so why why is it uh full of hackers because take note if you have if you have let's say a network with only let's say two connections you would know that oh these connections are definitely the u.s government no so if i if assuming this entire thing is store so assuming this entire block is store so this is the the tor network or this is the the dark web assuming this entire network is uh the dark web and and there's only two connections happening you will notice that oh this is definitely the u.s government so they yes their their connections are are secured but they're not really hidden people can tell if someone is sending or receiving data so in order to sort of protect their data they actually invited other people to use it so they invited the public so we have random people connecting um sending and receiving data so what's happening now is that random people let's say you and me will start using it uh, for their own purpose whether that's criminal or whether that's for you know journalistic purposes or other purposes now what will happen is that the connections of the u.s government are hidden so let's say if i'm an outsider uh, there, there, that's me i'm an outsider big dude let's say i'm looking inside i'll notice that oh there's like a million connections happening i don't know which one is the u.s government and which one is just some random uh, guy just trying to browse out of curiosity so what happens now is that the connections are so many there's just so many that now the u.s government is able to hide their communications from uh, prying eyes or from suspicious eyes that's the idea there so i hope that made sense um again the reason why it was created was for the u.s government to be able to communicate secretly with each other with their different let's say military assets or whatever um, communications they need to send but if they if they were just the only people on the dark web then it would be obvious that oh if there's lots of connections that means that the u.s is planning something but if we hide behind let's say people you know people making uh hacking people sending you know um selling drugs people doing illegal activities then we can hide what our uh, government officials are doing sir isn't that unethical you could say that yes it's somewhat unethical allowing hackers to use your service but uh, in the case of the u.s government they consider this a acceptable price to pay for securing their own connection securing their own data so here are some actual examples of websites using tor as you can see here the the link is in gibberish this is really how it looks like even here if you see this is really how it looks like and um the link ends in dot onion so you can see it's just random gibberish and then dot onion no if you try to access this maybe on your own computers on your own phone or internet nothing will happen literally nothing will happen uh, if you try to open this it will say oh website not found or website not not uh not uh detected so as you can see here this is uh, the hidden wiki it is similar to wikipedia but for the dark web we have wikileaks for for whistleblowers so as you can see here if you look down there fbi cia um, court court documents hacking documents some very sensitive information being shared online um, 
it's a deep web or dark web organization for CIA, FBI, uh, leaks, uh, Gorfnets, which is for an online chatting. Wow, look at that, a cute giraffe. So this is a site for online chatting. So as you can see, chat rooms, social, ASCII, Doom, privacy. Doom, I think, is for the game, I believe. Uh, donate and so on. So that is, again, a simple uh, website. Doesn't look very threatening. Even the logo is uh, a tiny giraffe. Gorfnets. We have one cent PM casino or online gambling. So as you can see, um, a website for online gambling for people who want to gamble uh, on different games, uh, poker, uh, blackjack, etc. Pirate Bay. Oh, some of you uh, might recognize this. This is for downloading music, games, movies, torrents. As you can see, um, it looks similar to the logo of, or it looks similar to the Pirate Bay that we find here on the surface or the deep web. Sir, um, what's the difference? Well, one difference is that uh, the Pirate Bay on the dark web uh, does not change. It's It's been the same for a long time. It hasn't been taken down compared to the surface web one, which is constantly being attacked, constantly being taken down by, you know, uh, the FBI or the CIA or whoever. So the dark web one is secured. It, it so far, to my knowledge, has not been taken down yet. Hidden answers. So uh, another place for, for you know, for, um, for uh, sending messages here. It is for sending messages or asking questions similar to Yahoo, Yahoo messages. So as you can see, different questions. Some of them don't really make sense. Is the school need to life? Excellent question there. Uh, different categories here. And as you can see on the ads, we have Darknet, Marketplace, hackers ransomware so again there is definitely hackers there's definitely drugs online but it's not exactly you know just full of it no uh let's demonstrate that by the next example wow dice time what the heck is this um dice time is jared's private blog he enjoys programming and playing video games you may say oh what the heck and if you look here yes this is an example of a website where um, this person is, uh, he made it because, you know, it sounds cool. He, he called it Dice Time, I believe, because it sounds cool. And he programmed it using HTML, which is a, a programming language, you could say. He's 14 years old from the US and he enjoys programming and video games there. So again, imagine that a 14 year old is able to access the dark web and not only that, but make their own website. So again, not exactly the most, you know, Yes, there is, there is criminals on the dark web, but there's also criminals on the surface web. There's criminals on Facebook. There's criminals on YouTube. That doesn't mean that, you know, it's just the whole thing is con uh, contaminated. So here, we can see just regular people just having a bit of fun, having a bit of, uh, having uh, just, you know, making their own content online. So it's, again, not really the, the mysterious dark place that they make it out online, no? Code Green, electric. Uh, ethical hacktivism these are people who claim to be hackers for a cause so more of people who are trying to hack maybe for a for what they think is a good cause or what they think is for the good of society we have zero day forum a forum for hacking marketplace accounts etc so if you are trying to um trying to um or this is a site that uh where people are sharing you know uh, information of hacked accounts, hacked information. We have Plastic Marketplace, uh, a place to find um, stolen credit cards. We have Vendor for hacked PayPal accounts. Facebook account hack for supposedly they'll hack a Facebook account if you pay them. Take note that this is usually a scam. So this is not really legit. You'll pay them and then they will run away and then you can't really do anything about it. No, Imagine going to the police. Oh, sir! Um, I tried to hack my friend online, but the 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 hacker scammed me. Imagine telling that to the police. No, that will that will not really work. This is again simply. These are usually scammers scamming scammers. We also have Victory Counterfeit. Another example. This 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 uh, site claims to make counterfeit U.S. dollar and euro notes. Uh, Dream Market. This is for selling drugs, and same with this, for selling drugs. Okay?
So that's pretty much it. Here's the references. I hope that you all learned something. So again, to summarize the deep web, we have three types of, we have three parts of the web, surface web, which is the surface level stuff, YouTube, Google, etc. We have the deep web, which is stuff hidden behind a login screen. So for example, your Facebook newsfeed, your YouTube page, your, if you have hidden videos or if you, if you have recommended videos, those recommended videos are usually hidden. If you log out of your account, your Facebook or your YouTube homepage will change. Uh, Twitter, some of your Twitter, DM, are your Twitter DMs are hidden, of course. Messenger, Zoom. Zoom, if you log into Zoom, if you have a meeting on Zoom, that is already the deep web. So that is uh, all part of the deep web. And then the dark web is now uh, a special site that, or a special place that can only be accessed using Tor. And it contains everything from, you know, um, people just posting for fun, uh, hackers, drugs, and so on. Okay, so that's pretty much it. I thank, uh, thank you all very much for listening to this lecture. The notes for this can be found on the link I sent in your group chat, bit.ly slash mtechno. Uh, the, the activity for this is two quizzes, uh, two short quizzes, 10 points each. Um, on Canvas, they have two attempts per quiz. So you can take each quiz twice. Okay, so please make sure you make the most of it. All right, so again, thank you very much for watching. And that is the end of the video.